Prior to forming the band Filter in the early 90s, Richard Patrick would play guitar in the band Nine Inch Nails. While Trent Reznor would lead the band, Patrick would play on their debut album, appear in several of their early music videos, and tour with the band over the course of four years from 1989 to 1993. It was after leaving Nine Inch Nails, Patrick would go on to form Filter, and they would go on to have a good deal of success in the 90s, but they hit some turbulent times, and today, let's take a look at the history of the band. Richard Patrick would be born in Needham, Massachusetts, and begin his career as a musician before he was a teenager, when he would perform the Rick Nelson song, Amy, for his fifth grade talent show. Eventually, his family would relocate to Ohio, and it was in his bedroom that he spent countless hours listening to the likes of Neil Diamond, Ozzy Osbourne, and U2, and Patrick would admit to the LA Times, and I quote, even my parents believed in me after a while. I dropped out of college and lived with my mom and dad, and they were like, just keep working at it, get yourself better, and keep writing new songs, and maybe something will happen. But he would make direct reference to his father in the band's 1999 hit song, Take a Picture, with the line, Dad, what do you think about your son now? He would admit to Loudwire years later that he had a pretty strained relationship with his father, admitting, and I quote, I went from the kid that had bad grades, smoked, and came home a little saucy from bars. My dad is this banker, this conservative kind of normal banker, and he's like, I don't know what to do with you, Rich. What am I to do with you? You're crazy. Richard wasn't the only of his siblings to go into show business, as he came from a family of five children. His older brother, Robert Patrick, would also drop out of college college and pursue a career in acting, something he'd be quite successful at, appearing in countless movies including Die Hard 2 and Terminator 2. Patrick soon became a member of the Cleveland music scene, playing in the new wave band called The Act, and he would soon have a chance meeting with another local musician named Trent Reznor at a music store who happened to be playing in a new wave pop act called Exotic Birds. Patrick's band would end up opening for Exotic Birds at a gig, and the two musicians soon struck up a friendship, and they would end up going to concerts together seeing groups like Skinny Puppy and Ministry. Patrick would recall that Reznor expressed his desire to start his own band and do his own music, telling Spin Magazine, and I quote, Trent had a collection of songs he was fishing around. He was curious. He tried things. He was like, I think I can rap a little. And so he does on Down In It. He was like, I like Depeche Mode and he writes Terrible Lie. Reznor would end up signing a deal with TVT Records, who would put out the band's debut record Pretty Hate Machine in 1989. Reznor would ask Patrick to join the band, and the guitarist would contribute to the group's debut record, even if it was minimal, playing the guitar feedback loop at the end of the track Sanctified. Patrick would also appear in Nine Inch Nails videos for Down In It, Head Like a Hole, as well as Wish, in addition to touring with the band. Pretty Hate Machine would also set a record, becoming one of the first independently released albums of the time to go platinum selling in excess of 3 million copies. While Nine Inch Nails was riding high off the success of their debut album and playing the first Lollapalooza in 1991, it was at this point Patrick soon realized there was a great amount of disparity in the band. He would tell Billboard magazine, There was a point in time where Trent just kind of looked at me and I said, Wow, you're going to New Orleans to go live in this beautiful house that you're getting? And I'm going to go back to my mom and dad's house. Patrick would reveal to author John Wiederhorn in the book Louder Than Hell, The Definitive Oral History of Heavy Metal, that during this time he was making about $400 a month playing in Nine Inch Nails. Meanwhile, he would frequently see Reznor destroy tens of thousands of dollars of equipment on tour each night. When Patrick revealed his concerns about not making enough money, Reznor told the guitarist, according to the Stop, Drop, and Talk podcast, Hey, listen, Rich, I know you need some extra cash. Listen, down at the end of the street, there's a little pizzeria and they need drivers. So maybe you can go make some extra cash over there. And I'm like, wow. At the same time, though, Reznor would encourage Patrick to write his own music and get his own record contract to get out of his awful financial situation and not solely rely on Nine Inch Nails. Patrick would take that advice to heart and started to record his own music. It was according to the book Louder Than Hell that Patrick would write the song Hey Man Nice Shot in 1991, and during his final days in Nine Inch Nails in 1993, he presented the song to Reznor, who took a liking to it and wanted to work on it. However, one day later, Patrick would receive a phone call from Reznor's manager, who told him that he had to relinquish all the publishing rights to the song, but he would still be credited on the track. Patrick wisely declined the offer and kept the song, 
And it was that moment that appeared to be the final straw for the musician who finally decided to leave Trent Reznor's outfit. Patrick would reveal to Wiederhorn the importance of Hey Man Nice Shot, saying, that song has literally paid my mortgage, paid for my life the past 15 years. Patrick would record a four song demo in his CD apartment in Hollywood that also included the track. Soon enough, the tape was sent to different labels and it would be Mike Austin, who was an A&R man for the Atlantic owned Reprise Records, who wanted to sign the musician. Patrick would tell Billboard, when he signed me, he came over to my CD Hollywood apartment from Beverly Hills, sees I have this 8-track and all the stuff, three woofers I'd stolen from my dad, and these realistic speakers, and my cat had nibbled on the cone of one of the speakers. He said, you did your demo with this gear? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I want to sign you right now. I'm not even going to wait. I know you're fielding other offers. Patrick would soon start working with former Nine Inch Nails programmer Brian Lee's gang, and the duo would retreat back to Ohio and set up shop in a three-story house in a Cleveland suburb called Rocky River. The house happened to be located next to a retirement home, and once the sessions were finished, the house would be demolished, with Patrick recalling to Billboard, they effing leveled the house after we left, and they used it to properly add on to the nursing home. He would also reveal in the same interview that he had a friend who used the house to, and I quote, store a bunch of his AK-47s and his ammo crates. We were next door to these old fogies living in a house filled with guns, beer, and recording equipment. Many people would get their first taste of Filter long before the band's label issued their first single. It was at Lollapalooza in 1994 that 10,000 four-song sampler cassettes were given to attendees by the band's record label. The label soon received 300 feedback forms that were included as part of the sampler cassette sets according to Billboard magazine. By late 1994, Patrick would be held up in Canton, Michigan going over the final mixes for Filter's debut record titled Short Bus. Patrick had started to question at this point in time whether he made the right decision in his life to leave Nine Inch Nails, but at the same time he also didn't want to ride Trent Reznor's coattails, specifically telling his label not to market him as the former guitarist from Nine Inch Nails. Those doubts however would be put to rest pretty quickly. Unbeknownst to Patrick at the time, while he was working on the final mixes, one of the album's unreleased tracks was already hitting rock radio across the country. That unreleased track would be the song Hey Man Nice Shot, which was set to appear in the Billy Zane movie titled Tales from the Crypt Presents Demon Knight in January of 95. That song would become Short Bus's lead single and one of Filter's best known tracks. It would turn out that one of the radio promo reps working at Filter's label had shared the song with different stations around the country and it would be a DJ in Colorado Springs who played the song at 2 in the morning and it would receive an overwhelmingly huge response and it soon started to show up all across the country at other radio stations. In fact, one of those radio stations was WHYT in Detroit, which became one of the first stations to play the song with the music coordinator telling Billboard magazine in 1995. Of course, there's a Nine Inch Nails influence. What Filter has done is add acoustic guitars and explore areas Nine Inch Nails hasn't yet. In fact, during the early weeks of Hey Man Nice Shot getting airplay across America, some radio stations were being asked by listeners whether the song was a Nine Inch Nails song, according to Billboard magazine. Rich Fitzgerald, who was the executive VP and GM at Reprise Records, would tell Billboard magazine, and I quote, We shipped it to alternative and hard rock stations three weeks later, and did a gradual build on it. A pattern developed where everywhere it was put on the air, phones lit up, and it didn't take a lot of airplay to do it. As a result of the single getting a lot of airplay, the band's label would move up the release date of Short Bus, and in order to hold the momentum, Reprise would issue 15,000 copies of the single on CD for 99 cents to a lot of mom and pop, as well as alternative leaning record stores. Soon enough, a video would be shot for the single, which would appear in MTV's Buzzbin. Hey Man Nice Shot would end up peaking at number 10 on the alternative rock charts and number 76 on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. Short Bus would be certified platinum peaking at number 59 on the Billboard 200 charts. While the song was written in 1991 but put out in early 95, some people from the public thought that it was written about the death of Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain. In fact, many DJs in Seattle pushed this idea, but in reality the song had nothing to do with Cobain. But the idea that some people felt that the band was profiting off of Cobain's death bothered Patrick for many years. Patrick would tell Billboard magazine, I eventually talked to Nirvana's Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic about it, and I assured them it wasn't about Kurt. I told them I wasn't trying to profit off of anyone's death, and that there's a phenomenon known as and people do it, and that I wanted to kind of understand it and raise the intellectual question of, you know, to be or not to be, and that whole thing. When Dave and Chris understood that, 
and I could look at them both in the eye, that's when I felt completely okay about it. So what's the song about, you might be asking? The song would take its inspiration from a Pennsylvania politician, state treasurer, R. Bud Dwyer, who had been convicted of bribery charges in December of 1986. He was waiting his sentencing, and one day before the sentence was to be handed down by the court, on January 22, 1987, he called a press conference where he unexpectedly shot and killed himself with a gun in front of reporters. No one else would be injured, and while Patrick remembered hearing news reports of the death when it happened in 1987, it would be during his time in Nine Inch Nails that it resurfaced for him again with him telling Billboard, on one stop there was this little booth that was selling books, and they gave me this weird videotape, I still have it, that wasn't Faces of Death, but it had footage from the press conference. In 1995, the LA Times would report that Dwyer's widow was pretty upset about the song and the effect it would have on her children and grandchildren. The family had planned to protest the song with Filter's label Reprise Records. While Dwyer isn't specifically named in the song, Patrick and Lee Skang would be forced to issue a statement at the time saying, and I quote, The song is not a celebration or glorification of taking one's own life. The phrase, hey man, nice shot, is not a reference to the final act itself, but rather an expression of guts and determination of a person standing up for what they believe is right. We are extremely sensitive and respectful to the family and friends of Mr. Dwyer. MTV would end up reviewing the liner notes for the band's debut album and would notice that Patrick's publishing company was called Buddy Dwyer, but Dwyer would be spelled D-O-I-W-E-R. So what did Trent Reznor think of his former bandmate's success? He would be interviewed by Spin Magazine in February of 96 and was asked about Patrick's success to which he responded, Rich was his friend and he played in the band for a while. Pretty good guy. We were working on Downward Spiral together, but he wanted to be the guy that got recognized for writing songs and singing. I didn't realize his real agenda was to have a way out to LA and to get a record deal for himself. When asked if there was a reconciliation between the two musicians, he added, there's been a drunken phone call to say hello and then asking an ex-girlfriend of mine out on a date. Those guys, in their minds, they're stars. Patrick would admit to Loudwire that his nickname in Nine Inch Nails was Piggy, and a week after leaving the band, Reznor wrote the song Piggy. It was following the release and tour for Short Bus that Patrick's partner, Lee Skang, announced he was leaving the group. Lee Skang would tell MTV at the time that creative differences and Patrick's indifference to his work were a large part of him leaving the band, stating, Rich wasn't taking a very active role in what I was doing. It was my perception that he wanted to continue to try and rewrite Hey Man, I Shot Her or whatever it was. I guess I've been making my own records for the last year, and so I called up two weeks ago and said I quit, I leave. Four years would pass until Filter released their long-awaited second record, and that four-year gap proved to be difficult for Patrick. While the band was still on some people's radars thanks to several high-profile soundtrack contributions, including Spawn and the X-Files movie, the band would undergo another lineup change. In addition to losing Lee Skang, Patrick would lose his drummer Matt Walker to the Smashing Pumpkins after Jimmy Chamberlain was fired. I've done a whole video on Chamberlain's firing, the link is down below. The long wait time between albums was also credited to Patrick's decision to build his own studio. By Patrick's own admission, he wanted to always be in a band and not just have a group of hired hands. He would tell Spin Magazine, the only person talking to me was my girlfriend, I got so unbelievably depressed. His first true love according to the magazine soon broke up with him, and it would result in the track I'm Not The Only One. Touring members from the group's first album, Gino Leonardo and bassist Frank Cavanaugh would take a bigger role in songwriting for the band's second album, named Title of Record. With Title of Record, Filter didn't want to repeat the same album with Patrick telling Billboard, we had goals in mind, make something for the fans and make something we are proud of, something that shows our growth. Short Bus was a tall punk rock black record, but it's very early 20s and juvenile sounding. Title takes people to a new place with a ton of hills and valleys. The album would feature, of course, more electronic music, bombastic, acoustic, and 70s era sounding songs. The lyrics on the group's second album also took a more serious tone with Patrick telling Billboard, I think I took lyrics more seriously this time around as well. A lot of them are based on everyday things that happen in my life, like breaking up with a girlfriend, getting angry, or feeling like I've lost control of my life. I am the mouthpiece of this band and I'm always trying to answer the questions I have about life. The title of record would be another success thanks to the single Take a Picture, which would become Filter's biggest hit to date, peaking at number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. The album produced another hit in the song Welcome to the Fold, resulting in the record going platinum. Leonardo would tell Billboard about the band's change in sound, saying, everybody was expecting another Hey Man Nice Shot and we went in the complete opposite direction. Some people probably feel alienated and they shouldn't. A good song is a good song. It doesn't matter if we play it harder or softer or use distortion or not. Patrick would admit in the same interview that some of his musician friends were taken aback by Filter's success 
saying, and I quote, a lot of them said, congratulations, it's hard to go from heavy to super light. They thought I planned it all, but the shtick of this band is we'll do anything. We'll show off our soft underbellies. We'll be hard, we'll be tough, we'll be melancholy and sad. I want to take a picture to be gorgeous, lush song, and that was it. It wasn't planned to be a top 10 hit. The song would be partially inspired by an event in Patrick's own life when he stripped down to his underwear while sitting in first class on a plane after being on a bender and getting into a fight with a stewardess. He would shed some more light on what he was going through at the time, telling artist directory. There was no thought behind it. It was off the cuff. It was emotional. I was so lonely. When you drink, you feel cut off from everybody. The isolation is wild. You isolate yourself, but then you realize you're left all alone. I'd get in trouble, I got arrested, but I was taken to a psych ward. That was the second time I had an issue on an airplane. I was like, I bet my dad's going to be proud of this. There's that song, Dad, I'm in jail. Take a picture was my homage to that. Patrick would reveal to Loudwire that it was a nurse who knew who he was and was a fan of Filter that helped him get out of the psych ward. The success of Take a Picture also resulted in other musicians remixing the song, resulting in Patrick's voice becoming a staple in clubs across America. In fact, the song soon topped the Billboard Hot Dance music and club play charts in 2000. Smashing Pumpkins bassist Darcy Retsky would appear on the album as well, providing backing vocals on the song Cancer, and inspired several of the other tracks on the album, including Take a Picture. Patrick would admit to Loudwire he had an intimate relationship with Retsky, despite the fact that she was married at the time. He would tell Loudwire, yeah, there's like two or three love letters on this record. There's Miss Blue, there's I'm Not the Only One, there's Take a Picture, there's Skinny, and there's It's Going to Kill Me. The Smashing Pumpkins were the biggest band ever. She was playing Soldier Field and she would say, get a car and come out to see me at my house. Patrick would also admit that the band's second album was helped by the change in rock radio, referring to the past several years of popular rock music as an, I quote, crap wussy rock. With rock radio shifting to more guitar heavy stuff, pointing to groups like Korn, Limp Bizkit, and Marilyn Manson, according to Billboard. The same songwriting approach that the band took on their second record was further expanded on their third album. Patrick would find inspiration for the album during a cross-country road trip he took before recording the album. It was on the record that he railed against what he saw as the commercialization and homogeneity of the United States, telling Billboard magazine, I'm so sick and tired of seeing McDonald's, Burger King, Subway on every single street. It's in a way an amalgamation of mutt. I think there should be way more focus on abstract thought and individualism as opposed to everybody trying to be the same. But not everything on the album was a criticism, with more positive themes coming through on the record, as Patrick would meet a lot of people and would claim the album was, and I quote, a celebration of freedom. Despite having a solid initial commercial performance thanks to the lead single, Where Do We Go From Here, and playing a number of shows in the lead up to the album's summer 2002 release, things quickly came apart. On the eve of a major tour to support the record, Patrick would check himself into rehab to deal with alcohol addiction. His bandmates soon left the group, and Patrick would admit to VW Music Rocks that the decision was disastrous for him financially, but it ended up being the best decision he ever made for his personal life. Patrick would claim he's been nearly 20 years sober since the incident took place, and he has tattooed the date of his sobriety on his forearm. While work on Filter's fourth album would begin in 2003, the band would go on hiatus for nearly half a decade while Patrick would pursue other musical projects, including the supergroup The Damning Well and Army of Anyone with the DeLeo brothers from Stone Temple Pilots. After these projects wrapped up, the band would return in 2008 with their fourth record, Anthems for the Damned, which was more politically and socially charged. The band would follow that up with 2010's The Trouble with Angels and 2013's The Sun Comes Out Tonight as well as 2016's Crazy Eyes, which took the band's sound into a new territory, with Patrick referring to it as, and I quote, New Industrial. Crazy Eyes was impacted by Patrick's father passing away, resulting in the track Take Me to Heaven. In the late 2010s, Patrick happened to be attending a Veruca Saul concert, which was also attended by original Filter member Brian Leesgang. It was during that concert that Louise Post of Veruca Salt called out both musicians to bury the hatchet and start making music together, which they ended up doing. In October of 2018, Patrick announced he was working with Lee Skang once again after nearly two decades, and the upcoming Filter album would be called Rebus, which they claimed was a proper sequel to the band's first record. Filter would end up taking donations through Pledge Music to fund the album's creation, but the donation site would end up declaring bankruptcy. Patrick wouldn't provide an update on the status of the album until the following year, during which he also elaborated that Lee Skang was no longer on the project, but several of the songs they had previously worked on would be making an appearance on the upcoming album. 
the band's upcoming album name They've Got Us Right Where They Want Us at Each Other's Throats is due for release sometime this year. So you guys are maybe wondering, what's Patrick's relationship with Reznor like after all these years? Well, he would reveal in an interview that he and Reznor have had a friendly relationship recently, and now they do text regularly and their kids have even had playdates. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.